the 1957 TT, the Golden Jubilee. Would it be a special meeting? It certainly would. The steam packet company's boats were working overtime to bring the fans and the riders to the island. If you recall your bike arriving this way, then you may also remember that you had to purchase a tax disc from the bank's government for riding on the island's roads. The Gilera team should have been Duke, Bob Brown and Bob McIntyre. But owing to Jeff's double spill at Imola in a pre-season meeting, his entry was scratched. Bob Brown started practice on a G45 matchless, but very soon reverted to the Gilera 4. Bob McIntyre was also entered in the lightweight race on Joe Potts 250 Norton. Um, he practiced on it, on the Clips course, but I believe he felt it advisable to park the Norton and concentrate on the Gilera for the races. Alistair King was also entered in the lightweight race on this twin cylinder dot entered by the company themselves. Um, it never appeared after practice. Tarquinio Pavini was not entered in the 57 TT. Here he practiced on the Mondial under the bead plate, passing Fron Perslow on his 125 MV. Also uh, making his TT debut was Derek Minter on this new Manx Norton. Course inspection car for 57 was a state-of-the-art MG sports car. If riders broke down in practice, they very often got a hitch back to the start. This is Ralph Renson being conducted back by Colin Broughton. During practice, 10 times TT winner Stanley Woods was given a gallop on a Works Motor Guzzi. He very much enjoyed the experience. Bill Barnett works his welding magic at the TT. Sadly, he passed away during the 1958 TT and his replacement was Ken Spason. The Motor Guzzi in the foreground with its multiple exhaust pipes appears to be the V8 that was ridden by Dickie Dale. If he broke down in 57, Kings of Oxford were always on hand to make running repairs. Terry Shepherd was the second MV rider, but sadly he crashed in practice at the Nook and non started, so he never got his dream of a TT ride on an MV. The Monday race was the Junior TT, held over seven laps, 264 miles. Taking his first TT victory was Bob McIntyre on the Gilera. He was followed home by Keith Campbell, who went on to become the world champion for 57 on his Moto Guzzi. And then Bob Brown bought the second Gilera home at third. Best Brit bike was Eric Hinton in fifth place. Manxman Dennis Christian finished 11th, winning a silver replica on his 7R. When Dennis finished 3rd in the 55 Senior Manx, he declared this was to be his last race. Dennis was still campaigning about 50 years later. We finished the Junior Review with this stunning artwork by Peter Haynes of Bob flying past the Highlander. Wednesday race action was held on the 10.92 mile Clips course. This was formerly a cycle course, but was to find a use for the sidecar and lightweight TT races from 1954 to 59. 
after which all races returned to the mountain course. It was so named as the course encircled the Clips Reservoir. The first Wednesday race was a lightweight TT and Carlo Ubiali appears to be heading his MV for the pavement and the photographer. Yes, the faster riders found a quick line through Parkfield evolved using the pavement. He wasn't alone. Tarquinio Pavini also used this line on his Mondial. Later in the race, both Ubiali and Pavini retired. Arnold Jones rode the LMA Special. Entered by Leicester Motorcycle Auto Sales, the machine was basically an Adler. The official results show that Franta Bartos finished fourth on a Jawa, but his machine is badged here as a CZ. Florian Cometheus rode solo and sidecar in his first TT. He finished ninth on his NSU in the lightweight. He was inadvertently flagged off after nine laps. They gave him an aggregate time for his previous laps, so he was awarded a silver replica. Just an hour later, he was out in the sidecar race. Chester dealer Bill Smith started his 43-year TT career in this race, finishing 15th on a Velocet entered by Reg Dearden. Leading the race at the start of the last lap, Ulsterman Sammy Miller fell off his Mondial at Governor's Bridge, pushing in to finish fifth. In close attendance to Sammy's right is Norman Brown, the TT's press officer. Taking a more sober line through Parkfield Corner than the Italians was the eventual winner, Cecil Sanford. He won by nearly two minutes from Luigi Tereri and Roberto Colombo. Standing behind Cecil in the winner's enclosure, smoking a pipe, is Arthur Taylor, Cecil's father-in-law, who encouraged his racing career. The buried Rick Willoughby, the Bluens TT reporter, waits to get the race story. The final leaderboard tells the race story. Sanford led for most laps, Tavari number three and Colombo number two made steady progress through the field. Parkfield Corner, first lap, and the fast-starting works Rensport BMWs of Fritz Hillebrand and Walter Schneider head the field, followed by Florian Cometheus, Cyril Smith and Pip Harris. The BMWs cleared off and took the predicted top three places. Fourth was Jackie Beaton and Charlie Billingham. On his TT debut, Charlie Freeman and Tom Leake were fifth, and Peter Woolett, passengered by George Loft, sixth. All Norton mounted. Cyril Smith, this time passengered by Eric Bliss, was again out of luck. He failed to get a finish in the island from any race he participated in. Ted and DC Young passed the grandstand on the E.T. Rye Triumph, one of the first Neela outfits. I recall Ted and Bill Bodice having some mighty ding-dong races at Brands in the 1960s. Fritz Hillebrand and Manfred Grunwald looked pleased with their day's efforts. They took the world title that year, but Fritz sadly died in a practice crash for the Spanish Grand Prix.
the flag drops and the mass ranks of the ultra lightweight field head off towards Parkfield on their 10 lap race. The trio that led off the line were Sammy Miller, Mondial 14 and MV teammates Luigi Taveri 4 and Carlo Ubiali 25. Once again, the speedy Italian aces were using the pavement route. Mondial master Tarquinio Pavini takes Parkfield, ahead of MV's Luigi Taveri. His victory in the ultra lightweight TT meant a double for the Bologna factory, with Cecil Sanford winning the lightweight earlier that day. Tarquinio ended the year as ultra lightweight world champion before the factory withdrew from GP Racing. He was then recruited by MV. Runner-up Carlo Ubiali heads his MV down Ballonard Road, while we get a rear view of Swiss teammate Luigi Taveri, also at Parkfield. What's going on here? Franta Bartos gives his CZ a cursory glance. He went on to finish 7th and first non-Italian machine home. Bert Fruin campaigned his home-built Fruin specials at the TT for many years. This was his double knocker four-stroke. From his eight TT rides he only finished once. Oops, a slight overshoot for Bert at Parkfield. Watford's Jim Bound rode the only Montessa in the race. He retired on the fifth lap. Bound was the UK importer for the Spanish machines, converting this road model to racing spec. The last finisher in the ultra lightweight was Leonard Tinker on his MV. He finished 20 minutes behind the winner. The winner's enclosure. Pavini is congratulated by MV teammates Ubiali and Taveri. MV racing team boss Nello Pagani in the Mac stands between his riders. Two of the guests of honour at the Golden Jubilee meeting were TT pioneers Rem Fowler and Jack Marshall. Rem is being introduced to Lord Bradburn of Tara. He won the Twin Cylinder class in 1907 on his Peugeot powered Norton. Jack Marshall won the Single Cylinder class in 1908 on his Triumph. Note the spare belt and toolbox. They had to do all their own running repairs in those days. The Pioneer TT races were held on the St John circuit. The 16 mile course ran from Peel to Balacrane, Kirk Michael and back through to Peel. Just before the senior, members of the Vintage Motorcycle Club did a ride past on their pre-1930 machines. First starter in the Golden Jubilee Senior TT, Jack Brett heaves his Lord Montague of Bewley sponsored Manx into life. Fastest Norton rider throughout most of the race, Jack slid off at Quarry Bends on his sixth lap whilst holding a leaderboard place. Keith Campbell takes off on his guzzy single. He struggled to get it fired and contrary to the dire warnings given by the mechanics he pulled the choke on. It fired up straight away. He finished fifth but was destined to win the 350 World Championship that year. Bob McIntyre heads for Bray Hill. His standing start lap was a mere 99.99 mile an hour. 
Arthur Wheeler rode the eight-lap senior non-stop on his 350 Guzzi. With only 17 seconds difference on his flying lap times, he averaged nearly 87 mile an hour to take a bronze replica, four mile an hour faster than his junior speed. Louis Carr brings his G45 matchless out of Governor's Bridge. Louis finished 21st on the Push World Twin. Bob McIntyre had slackened his pace on the last lap, allowing John Surtees to pass him on the road at the Craig, but he was by then two minutes ahead on time. Thousands of race fans had arrived for Senior Friday on excursions laid on by the motorcycle press. The day round trip consisted of a coach or train journey to Liverpool and an early arrival at Douglas when they either walked or got one of the many coaches that took them to their favoured vantage point. At the conclusion of this never to be forgotten race they made their way back to Douglas for the return journey. Jeff Tanner was holding sixth place on lap seven when he ran out of fuel on the mountain, freewheeling and pushing home to finish 28th. Earlier, he ran wide at the bungalow and narrowly missed the hotel, nearly starting the demolition process. It is frightening to watch on film. What it felt like from the saddle we can only imagine. For those who wonder what the bungalow was, this is the building, as you see, right on the racing line. It was demolished in winter of 1958. Averaging just under 99 mile an hour, Bob McIntyre takes the chequered flag after a milestone race. In the winner's enclosure, he is congratulated by John Surtees. Sir Ambrose Dundas Flux Dundas Lieutenant Governor of the Isle of Man waits to congratulate Super Mac. Three Gilera riders, past and present, chew the fat after the senior TT. Jeff Duke and Reg Armstrong chat with third placeman Bob Brown in the finishers enclosure. We finish this review with another of Peter Haynes' fabulous paintings and the glorious sound of Bob McIntyre's Gilera. Thanks for watching.